tree. I hereby call to order this Committee of the Whole meeting for Monday, December 9th, 2024. The time is 8 o'clock a.m. Will the clerk please call the roll? Aaron Stone. Here. Bonnie Kim. Here. Allison Pavlis. Here. Amy Paling. Lisa Schneider Fabes. Here. John Cesaretti. Here. Ann Hart. Here. I seek a motion to approve the minutes of the November 11th, 2024 Committee of the Whole Meeting. I move to approve the minutes of the November 11th, 2024 Committee of the Whole Meeting. May I have a second? Second. The motion has been made and seconded. Board members, are there any comments, errors, or omissions to the minutes? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll? Ann Hart? Yes. Bonnie Kim? Yes. Allison Pavlis? Yes. Lisa Schneider Fabes? Yes. John Cesaretti? Yes. Aaron Stone? Yes. Motion carries. I seek a motion to adjourn to sec sorry, I seek a motion to adjourn to executive session to discuss special education, individual student matters, specific personnel, and collective negotiations. So moved. May I have a second? Second. Motion having been made and seconded, will the clerk please call the roll? Bonnie Kim? Yes. Allison Pavlis? Yes. Lisa Schneider Fabes? Yes. John Cesaretti? Yes. Ann Hart? Yes. Aaron Stone? Yes. Motion carries. We are now adjourned to executive session and the time is 8.02 a.m. All right, we are back in our regular meeting and we're ready for facility development committee, Mrs. Kim. Thank you so much. Um, I am going to turn it over to Mr. Beltemeyer. Okay. Share my screen. Okay. So today's topic is taking a look at our capital project summary, uh, going out five years. Um, so just a little like background as we start to think about what this might look like, um, you know, with the board recently approving that junior high um, first floor classroom air conditioning, which is the, the bottom row here and highlighted in green. Um, you know, one way to look at like how project, like capital projects have been here for, you know, basically a dozen years is that we are now wrapping up what, what I kind of view as the third kind of initiative that would be coming to a clo close. The first being renovating all the learning commons, you know, not all done at once, took a few years. Then we get closer to the end of the 20 teens and then, um, you know, expanding our, our elementary buildings uh, so they can handle some full day programming for kindergarten. And then after that was, um, you know, switching and um, focusing on classroom air conditioning. And while we did a lot of that in one summer, um, it definitely took multiple summers. So now we find ourselves where we have really just a couple of projects that we had continued to plan to do um, over the last handful of years. Um, in the summer of 26, the next project that we've that really talked about would be replacing the windows at the at the junior high, um, which uh, are believed to be original to the building, and in, in in nearly all parts of the building, so that's in, that's a that's a huge need. Um, but really, when we then start to think about well, what comes into that next you know five to six or even seven year window, um, this, you know, thinking of it in terms of initiatives, you know, of something that might be easy for people to, you know, rally around. Um, I don't really see anything. I see, you know, potentially lots of different things, some which are things that we, we might like to do when certainly combined with things that 
um, you know, we need to do that as we hit the later parts of the 2020s and, and, and turn into the 2030s where there might be roofs or mechanical equipment or um, just other updates that we really just have reached a point where we need to address. Um, so I don't, as far as uh, in, the, in the kind of the process for identifying what takes priority after that junior high window replacement in the summer of 26, um, you know, that's certainly not a one day conversation and even not really a conversation for today. Um, I, I do plan to be back in the first few months of calendar year 25 and start the process and identify what, what do we want to have as our priority and, and talk about what is possible. So just as a, um, so really today is just kind of some brief information. Um, you know, I have for summers 27, 28, and 29, I have some smaller amounts relative to maybe what we've historically spent in any given summer. Um, but the perspective for that is that's what, when we get to the projections next, that is what's available, or at least in the projections for right now, um, to spend on projects. And then the other, the other consideration is, is during our bond issuances in the early part of the 2020s, and especially with the most recent issuance in 23, was we wanted to leave ourselves some flexibility later this decade um, to, you know, to be able to address capital projects that might come up. And so I've noted on here, um, really during fiscal year 29, um, District 39 will see some debt service extension-based capacity come available. That becomes available with tax year 28, but tax year 28 is paid during calendar year 29. So really, as far as when could things be issued, it would probably be like late in calendar year 28 or certainly the first month or two of calendar year 29. Um, and just for perspective, depending upon what the interest rates are, um, I think we'd be looking at somewhere of having between 10 and 13 million available to us to issue in bonds. Um, the one thing to keep in mind is just because that's what's available when that time period arrives, doesn't mean that the district would have to issue that much. Um, it could certainly be done in, in multiple, over multiple summers where you could, you know, issue three, four, five million in one summer, one, one issuance, wait a year or two, come back and, you know, as the projects dictate it. Um, overall, like, um, you know, I, I think we're still in a good spot. I think the one thing, at least until we hit that 29 um, uh, potential issuance is that while we, I think it'll be good to identify what projects get priority, you know, we, we tr truly are kind of hitting a period where it's a little bit of wait and see as we go from year to year, waiting to see what happens with each round of um, completing a fiscal year, how, how were the budget actual results, what kind of um, things that are outside of our control um, financially, um, how, how did they, how do they impact us? Um, those are all things I'll talk about during the five-year projections, but certainly what I've tentatively listed here, um, the size of some of those projects could certainly grow as, as funds became available um, or, or if the need, need arose. Um, that's really all I have for today. Um, happy to answer any questions, but certainly um, somewhere between probably January and, and April, we'll definitely be talking about projects and priorities and, um, it, and it probably won't just be at one meeting. Bonnie, did you want to call on people? If you want me to. Yes, I okay, would. Thank you. John. <laughs> um, thanks, Corey. Super helpful. And I, I think you've articulated really well kind of the basis for this projection, which is more or less anticipated needs, um, but also hedging that there's going to be more needs. because There's no way we are going to have the physical plant we have and maintain it with mm -hmm. $2 million right. in 2028. Yeah. Uh, so 
I just worry about this kind of thing being taken out of context. Um, like you've given us good context here. I wonder if we should we should maybe rename this projection or just maybe things we know about now, you know, because it's, if you look at our history, we've invested a lot more, I think, in the last 10 years. And I can't see, you know, by year. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Out. Versus in the future, I, I don't see how we can anticipate investing all that much less. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, is this a warning that, you know, maybe some of our, um, um, put this, some of the expenses that are kind of hitting us in the near future are, are going to put a squeeze on capital projects in the future, because that's typically, I think, what happens. I don't think that's our intention at this point. I think really it is just an acknowledgement that some major projects have come to conclusion. Yeah. Congratulations to the board and, and to the community for having been able to accomplish so many of those really major projects. And I think what um, we are simply acknowledging is that that next, we, we don't foresee a, a big project beyond um, the infrastructure maintenance and ongoing care for our facilities. That's not to say that one won't come right now there isn't that next goal in mind um and really it's it's because we have been able to accomplish those three um add in large space air conditioning really it's been four pretty significant projects over the last several years that have been goals of our community for quite some time so it's it's really just um kind of acknowledging as we continue to do this five-year projections model we don't have major projects kind of knocking on the door on the horizon. So as the board considers going out um, for our next strategic planning process, we may want to um, think about what other needs may exist or just simply acknowledge that our facilities need continued maintenance and care, but we're not expecting major renovations of our buildings, which then allows us to focus on some other areas, which are, um, super important, teaching and learning and professional development and in some of the other areas that have been identified. So um, really it, it's it's simply acknowledging kind of where we're at right now and, and where we're looking forward as we um, think about the next five years. Oh, thanks, Gary. That was helpful. I, I remember, um, geez, I'm maybe rolling off the board here soon. <laughs> um, I remember we did years ago, I asked the question about, or someone asked the question about new buildings and how old are our buildings? Yeah. And they're old, <laughs> so, but they're very well maintained as our architects and engineers told us. So, but they're still pretty old. True. Yeah. And I think there was a point at which there was some discussion around, wow, if we're going to invest this much in new roofs and in air conditioning and in expansion for full day kindergarten and in renovation for the learning commons, does that make sense or does it make sense instead to raise the building and erect something completely new and contemporary. And I think the board made those decisions. It put us now in a position that we don't have these major projects. And financially, I think we're in a pretty good spot. So um, it really is just a, an acknowledgement and we will continue to do this. No doubt something will um, come up at some point, but for right now, um, we have the opportunity to, to celebrate some accomplishments and then to think about kind of as we go out to strategic plan for the next five years at the end of next year, what what are some of the major goals or initiatives we might want to explore? Any other questions? Thanks so much, Corey. All right. Mrs. Stone. Thank you. We will move on to school finance committee. Mr. Caesar Reddy. Thank you, President Stone. Okay, I am also going to turn this over to Corey because he has two important items to discuss. Okay. All right. Uh, December meeting. It's when we do our five-year financial projections. Um, it's always, you know, a nice time to to take a look, go through this exercise and look at these in detail. Uh, a couple of reasons. One, usually by now we have a firm grasp on what the prior fiscal year concluded at. And two, it's been, you know, a year and there's a lot of different assumptions or things that may have changed. It's always good to take a fresh look. So as I walk through um, a lot of the assumptions, I'm going to really just highlight, 
try and highlight the ones that have the largest impact um, and offer thoughts on those. There are many, many assumptions, uh, you know, made in any, any projections. Um, so first thing, we'll start with revenues. Um, since property taxes are our largest driver on the revenue side, um, this gets the most focus. Uh, so here in, here in bullet point one, um, we detail out what CPI looks like, which fiscal years are impacted. Um, so the most recently completed year, we were at 3.4%. Okay, well, that impacts how we compensate individuals through our contracts. That's for next fiscal year. We're um, 10 months, we know 10 months of data for calendar year 24. And in a couple more days, we'll find out what CPI looked like for, for or, uh, November. But right now we sit at 2.9%. Um, then the next couple of years, the 2.3 and 2.4, those are estimates from um, Bloomberg. And then the last year is just kind of what their long-term target is. Um, Bloomberg did not have something for that. But as you start to see, compared to what we've had the previous few years, um, you start to see, when you see numbers in the twos, um, that's probably a little more typical for the long term, what we would expect related to CPI. Then the next area is new growth. Um, we've got some information related to what the value of new growth is worth to us. Um, that's always going to be a really important component for D39. Um, you know, we get that CPI, but then we also get that, that new growth bump on top of it. And um, when we look at, you know, over the last 10 years, we see that the dollar value associated with that additional amount is anywhere from 280 to $760,000 um, with, with more of your average being around 487. Another assumption um, embedded in the, in, the, in the projections is our, our net collection rate for property taxes. So when we look back, we're at 98.6. Um, you know, going back a decade or more, that's, that's roughly what we average. Um, and, and just for uh, reference, if we were to go up or down a half percent, that's worth about 338,000 currently. Um, you know, it wouldn't be unheard of if any what, one given year we ended with either an, anywhere from like a 98% to a 99% um, collection. Another big thing, particularly the last last few years, um, that has been very beneficial to not only D39, but any district that has fund balance, is interest revenue. So we finished fiscal year 24 at um, 1.96 million. And going back uh, a number of years, almost a couple of decades, information I could find, that was the highest annual amount. And when I said, well, then I, when we, Think about any one area that's currently sitting at a historical high or in a beneficial position to D39. I start to think about well, what happens when things regress. And in talking with some of the companies that we invest with, they've provided um, some information about where they think interest rates might go. Certainly in calendar year 25 and 26. And so what I've got in here is I've listed out what I've done with the projections for interest revenue, um, that fiscal year 25 budget's a million eight. And then I've kind of stepped it down um, 26 and 27 based upon what the economists are projecting, the likelihood of rate cuts over the next couple of calendar years. And then after that, we're just kind of regressing back to what, um, our historical average is, which is almost a 20 year average of 492,000. Um, one thing to note, which is, shouldn't be a surprise, all the years within this projection um, do not have any revenue related to keep 39 fees since the district will be offering a full day uh, program starting this upcoming fall. Um, and then state and federal level, generally speaking, uh, very, very flat not a lot of uh, assumption of, of, of receiving help from, from either of those sources. And then the last big revenue area 
is somewhat similar to interest revenue where you know things had been relatively stable corporate personal property property replacement taxes um you know coming out of the pandemic we really shot up um it was not uncommon for us to have five six seven hundred thousand dollars a year in revenue in this line item and then all of a sudden we were at a million five for a couple of years um the last last year and then for this current year we we are starting to see a downward trajectory um i had at the time of the fiscal year 25 budget we had not yet received any information from the Illinois Department of Revenue. Um, and so I had to actually set the fiscal year 25 budget below what we had collected in fiscal year 24. And yet that was not enough, that was not enough of a decline to uh, mirror what um, the Illinois Department of Revenue has for us. They've got us at barely over 700,000 now. So you think about, you know, a me kind of a meteoric, meteoric rise and nearly doubling this revenue item. And now we're um, you know, basically reverting to what we were prior to that, to that rise. Um, so in this projections, I've got it set at 730,000. Um, you know, certainly if economics were to change within the state, that's an area where that, that could go up. Um, I'm not sure that I see much more of a, a downward trajectory for this line item compared to what it is. Um, now switching to the expenditure assumptions, uh, so on the expenditure side, salary and benefits are gonna be our biggest cost. Uh, thankfully, we, we've, um, you know, have some settled years with our contracts, particularly with WEA. So we've got three out of the five years in this projections. Um, we know what our, our settled rates will be. We can make some assumptions. Um, less so with SSU or beyond this fiscal year, we just have one more year. Um, before we would need to be negotiate again. Another big thing that can can uh, offer some some savings is when those certified staff members retire. Um, so I've listed out for the for the fiscal years um, within the projections. Those are the number of known certified staff retirements. Um, the year that we just uh, the fiscal year that we're in right now. Um, saw a huge benefit because we had, I think 12 or 13 staff members retire. And so that, that was it. That was a huge savings for the budget for this current year. Health insurance cost. We have, um, you know, seen fluctuations above and below 5%. We've got 5% in there. Um, our most recent renewal was, was a good one compared to the prior couple of years. Um, but, you know, we're part of a co-op and, um, the group takes a look at potential changes and, and tries to actively manage what um, things that what things that we can do to keep, to keep that annual rate at a reasonable level. And then as we start to think about the non non uh, personnel cost, um, we have things like purchase services, we have supplies and materials, including utilities, and then we have you know tuition costs for outplaced students or or capital outlay. Um, in each of those areas, generally speaking, we're, we're assuming uh, increases anywhere from like two to three and a half percent, things that would typically mirror inflation. Uh, maybe an outlier to that is our um, insurance renewals for liability and workers' comp. Um, those have tend to run higher, and we um, are assuming ranges of five to eight percent. So those are a lot of the higher level assumptions. Now let's take a look at what does the operating funds, which is the focus of doing this exercise, what does the operating funds um, percentage of expenditures look like with, with, the, with these projections? So we've got four years of, of known information, known fiscal years that are, that are completed. So the most recent one, we're finishing at roughly 52.3%. Um, based upon solely the fiscal year 25 budget, 45.45%. And then as you can see, um, you know, things dip down a little bit, but we're still above 40% in the, in the remaining years. One thing to keep in mind as I start to, you know, talk about certain areas, uh, you know, doing these projections, there's always some level of conservativeness, you know, embedded in there. Um, 
you know, particularly we think about fiscal year 25, we're not quite to the halfway point. Um, but when I look at the budget to actual, I, I certainly feel very good about where we're at right now. And I would expect us to end up with a positive budget variance once again. Um, still too early to make any predictions about how large that might be. Um, but certainly I would expect the positive variance coming out of fiscal year 25, which would uh, you know, impact each of these percentages in, in a positive manner. All right, this particular uh, summary is the operating funds, it's revenue and expenditures at a very high level, um, very similar uh, to the two, to two pages ago. One couple of things I'd like to point out, um, when I look at this page in particular, the, the first two line items that I look at every single time, surplus deficit, which is just revenues minus expenditures. I want to know, like, where how are we doing there? A um, couple of reasons, because then when we go to these red numbers, where it's the other financing uses, we have committed to spending a million dollars of operating funds to repay principal and interest on our debt certificates. So we want that surplus and deficit to always be above a million. Um, and then that, then we, after we take out the transfers, we then get to our other financing um, sources and uses, surplus and deficit. Um, that number includes transfers out for those debt certificates, plus any transfers that we move from the operating funds to the capital projects fund to pay for those larger construction projects. Um, so as you can see, these amounts uh, you know, they, they are in many ways the driver of having some smaller capital projects in those out years. As I said, the one caveat is I have not incorporated, you know, any bond issuance amount, which would allow us to uh, tackle several projects. Um, but I, I, I had wanted to create these with, without that bond issuance being in there. Um, and as you can see, as that surplus deficit starts to, to whittle down, part of that is, um, you know, interest rate revenue regressing um, and just general conservativeness. Um, you know, as I look at a page like this, my focus is really um, fiscal years 26 and 27, thinking about what the information that um, has the highest likelihood of, uh, of coming true. And then thinking about, you know, the, the back years are, they're definitely important to be aware of, but the reality is we're going to make so many decisions um, operationally, financially, that, you know, they're more of a FYI from my perspective um, versus anything else. Here's the, just the revenues of the operating funds. Um, breaks it down a little bit more. You can see, you know, CPPRT has its own line, evidence-based funding, and then some of the other state revenue um, that are embedded in there. And then at the bottom, you see that, um, that graph that really illustrates that, you know, 83% of our, our money is coming from property taxes. And then when you look at some of the other local sources, um, you know, we're, we're heavily dependent upon what happens within the D39 boundaries. And then on the expenditure side, uh, very similar as well. Not surprising, salary and benefits up near that 80% mark. Um, these are each of the object areas, salary benefit, and then you know purchase service supplies and materials being our, our two biggest other areas. Um, one last thing I wanna show, even the, um, I have more documents for, for people want to look at it by fund. Um, this graph shows the top half is um, five years of actual with our budget for fiscal year 25. Always great to see um, revenues exceeding expenditures in every year. And then even as we look out into our projected years, um, still great to see that revenues and expenditures um, 
revenues exceed expenditures in each of those years. Uh, at this point, I'm happy to answer any questions anyone has about any aspect of this or like I said, there's so many assumptions that go into it. You can, you know, you know literally make, you know, a hundred variations if, if you really wanted to. Scoring, that yep. was excellent. That's a lot. Any questions, thoughts, comments? Yeah. Aaron. I'll just say, thank you. This is a lot of work and it shows um, prudence. And so I just really appreciate that. Yeah, it's super, yeah, sorry, yeah. No, I, I agree with Aaron. And I think when I was reading through it, um, I was glad when I saw the revenue summary and the revenue going up, because when you go through all of the points in terms of revenue, they're all flat to down with mm -hmm. the exception of new growth. And then when you walk through all of the expenses, they're flat to up with the exception of the retiring teachers. So I'm like, oh boy, this... <laughs> Yeah. Is, is painting a um, could paint a difficult story, but again, to your point, Corey, of the um, amount that's driven by those top tax dollars. So I was glad to see the revenue going up, um, and um, again, just appreciate the um, careful conservative planning. Anyone else? Um, I, I have a I have a couple. Um, so. So that was, I, I loved your slide about evidence-based funding. And I think my recollection on how the evidence-based funding reform worked was that we were frozen in, more or less as a district in how much subsidy our district got from the state. So, and that looked frozen in the projections. Yeah, we, it's been really consistent since that's been implemented. You know, we're in that depending on how you look at highest or last tier of like getting, yeah. fun, like we're going to get the least amount and the, all the districts that are in ours, you know, they're giving us something, but it's, I think, yeah, they're giving us like an extra, so we're at 2.8 million. They're giving us like an extra one or 2000 total each fiscal year. Right. And I, I honestly believe the only reason they're doing that is so they can say that every district got yeah. some new money. Right. But it was, yeah, if you were in the, yeah. if you were the complete opposite, right, where you were heavily reliant, yeah, you're getting huge increases. Yeah. Um, so, okay, so this gets me to my related question. So is it, I didn't, forgive me for not saying it, what, what percent are we at now in local resources paying for the district? Oh, I'd have to look that up, but I'm pretty sure we're up over 100%. Based upon their calculation, no, I'm saying I'm saying like for, for property taxes and oh, what percent that. are yeah, we, are we oh. in the 80s? 90s? So property taxes, like based upon the the operating funds, property taxes are 83. But when you add in like local fees, replacement taxes, um, things that are considered local sources, uh, it usually ends up being a little over 90 percent, and it'll probably go up. Right, yeah. state funding is right. like what it is. Right. right. It should go up. It's yeah. Percentage to go would up. go up. Yeah. Because, yeah. Okay. Long term, I would expect that to incrementally slowly, since we're already over 90, yeah, yeah it'll slowly, slowly go up yeah. until something else changes. That's all I had. It is, it's amazing. I mean, it amazes me because you look at how. A, I've done a little bit of research on on how other states fund their schools, and we were, I think, the re one of the reasons we did evidence based funding in the state was to provide more state support to less um, less economically uh, supported districts, basically. Mm -hmm. And so, like, my understanding is that's working, which is good, um, but it also results in lo more local resources being needed to fund the district so I, w I was thinking about Anne's question you know it's at some point it's yeah I don't know it, it'll be in the future you know it's there could be mm -hmm. Illinois would have to totally change its model which who knows far far future huh? for there to be any issues okay thank you that's all I have all right all right let me 
Reshare my screen and we'll go over the last slide. The other topic under the school finance committee then is transportation and starting to look at that. So Corey will lead us through that discussion as well. Okay. All right. So uh, regular transportation. So we've talked about this several times the last few years. Um, I wanted to, so to the, the goal of today is not necessarily to make any decisions, certainly the board can provide feedback or direction as they so choose, but that's not necessarily the goal today. Um, I plan to come back, hopefully January or February, but targeting January, where we would present all student fees and the board could take one holistic view of everything before they're um, making, making decisions on what fees might look like for the 25, 26 school year. But related to transportation, um, I wanted the board just at least to have some information. And there's one thing that um, I will ask as we get, get near the end. Okay, so we've got a history of actual expenditures versus fees collected. We've always taken a look at what is that surplus or loss? Well, each of these years, it's, it's been, the program has been a loss. Um, and so when we look over here on the right-hand side where we've got the round trip and the one-way bus fee, going back a few years, when we realized that we were, you know, in the neighborhood of 60% of covering our cost. You know, I remember the conversation was we, we, we could do one massive jump or knowing that demand for the bus may be impacted by the price, we decided to make some incremental steps. And as we increased from 575 to 695 and then 792, Okay, yes, we certainly made um, some improvement in the percentage of fees covered. Ending fiscal year 24 at 68, a little over 68% covered by rider fees. Um, then then we, we have a 20% increase in, roughly a 20% increase in the fees charged to, to the riders for this current school year. And what I've got, for the 2425 line is um, some estimated expenditures based upon the number of routes and what we've seen in our what we've been billed by North Shore so far. And so I see we're looking at 981,000, a little roughly 981,000. Then on the revenue side, um, we've collected, you know, the overwhelming majority of our fees. And when I look at where I would anticipate us to end, it's roughly 759,000. Okay, so now our deficit is 222,000. It's dropped by 100,000 and we're covering 77%. Well, a couple of factors are, are in play here when I look at this. Yes, revenue has gone up, but it didn't go up 20%. So we definitely lost riders and I'll get to that in a little bit. But the other thing that is in, uh, impacting that equation in, in a big way is historically, when we've offered sign up starting in the spring to our families, what, what we've said is, if you would like to ride the bus, sign up by like the middle of July and we'll put you on a bus. We've had no capacity constraints, no mileage requirements of like how far you can how close you can be to a school or how far away you have to be from a school. And once all those data points come in, we create the routes and that drives the number of buses that we need getting kids to school, you know, on time and, and going to school. For 23, 24 fiscal year, we had 14 round trip or 14 buses morning and evening, morning and afternoon. For this year, we have 12, 12 and what I call 12 and a half. We have 12 in the morning and 13 in the evening. So that like is helping to hold down our, our expenditure side. And that's, you know, worth a little over a hundred thousand, um, which is why the, with a six and a quarter percent increase in our cost, we actually are, are expecting to, to end with lower costs. Okay. So then I look ahead to next year, which we're not necessarily trying to make a decision today on. 
but I've assumed, let's just say it's four and a half percent increase in cost. And then we didn't do anything with fees. Um, you would see that we would be dropping, assuming that we've got the same number of writers, our, our percent of fees would, would drop a little bit. All right, so let's look at a couple other factors. Um, here are the writers, that, at least that I've tracked the last few years. Um, not a lot of, as we made some of those prior price adjustments, things were, were, were fairly similar. Um, and while we did drop this year, um, a couple of things that I, I find noteworthy. Um, that is roughly in the neighborhood of, I'd say a 10% drop in, in writers. Um, when we did sign up, you know, at some point, I think we were, as we were making these incremental increases in the writer fees, at some point, I think the board and administration was certainly thinking at some point we will hit a wall and demand for the bus may plummet. And certainly when we had our initial sign up, I thought maybe we had hit that point. Um, but then at what often happens is in that period from roughly say July 15th through the start of the school year, or even like a week or two into school, as families go from elementary to high crest or high crest to junior high, they realize I want the bus. And so in the past, we've had anywhere from like 30 to 50, like wait listed families where we let the right, the the routes mature a couple of weeks before we start, which usually equates to right after Labor Day where we process anybody who is waitlisted. Well, this year that was up around like 150. It may actually be a little bit more than that. So that 150 then got us more to where we're, we're at now with, with the 950. Um, you know, was that, you know, I, I feel like the communications were similar. Was it solely the price? Was it people that just dismissed it? I don't know, but we'd certainly now have enough data to know that like, yeah, we have, decreased writers. Um, so that certainly plays into the decision as we start to think about what my options look like for next year. One other thing I wanted to point out, um, round trip, just because I know we've talked about it in the past, at the current rates, round trip is $5.40 a day, and in one way is $3.23. Um, and then one other thing I wanted to point out before I get into the one question that I, that I do look for direction today, I wanted to, to point out, um, just like how we pay for, pay for the busing. So this page right here is from our contract, our co one-year contract extension I signed last spring or winter. Um, top right, you see like the rate per bus per day. So one of the interesting things is, you think about it from the bus company standpoint, nearly all their costs, once a bus goes out, that's like having the bus, having the driver, it's expensive, like from their perspective is expensive. Now, whether that bus driver goes out to say an elementary school and does one route, right? They pick up one route of kids, drop them off, and then they go back to their, their bus station, and then they do the same thing in the afternoon, that's considered a single tier. Well, that's almost $430. But if we do a double tier, which is the majority of our routes, it's only an extra $13. And then if you go to a triple tier, which we have some of those as well, that's only another $13. So there's certainly advantages. And just for reference, um, for the regular ed, we have three routes, or three buses that do three tiers morning and afternoon. We have seven buses that do two tiers morning and afternoon. And then we have just two buses that do one tier. Um, so it gives you an idea of like where the where hey, the cost savings are. Can interrupt. So tier means like doing two routes. So like oh, okay. I'll give you an example. So we like clearly the and I'll give you uh, uh, the amounts annual amounts just to give you a reference point. A single tier bus for the whole year, right? 176 days is 75,374. But a double tier bus is 77,676. And then a three tier bus is 78,823. So like 
you know, on an annual basis, like it, it definitely is in our interest to have those double and triple tier routes. And just for reference of like what that might look like, I'm just taking one that services the, the older kids. Corey, um, and a tier means what? What, what does each, it mean to be a single tier versus yeah. a double tier? Like what is that bus actually yeah. doing for us? Right. So, so here's an example from, from, from the junior high and, and high crest. So in the morning, a three tiered bus, it goes out does a route, picks up um, students for band. Then as soon as it drops them off, it goes back out, does a route for junior high, drops them off at junior high. Then it goes out and picks up another group of kids and takes them to high crest. So it does three, essentially tier equals, equals distinct routes. Um, so you get an idea of like adding or deleting routes can have a very yeah. large impact on the overall equation, um, which I guess brings me to, to the next question. So when I think about where we have been with contracts, um, we have the last several years, at least since uh, more or less I've been here, we've been able to go year to year and we could certainly do that again. Um, but one of the things I had been planning to do is for regular transportation, knowing where we're at, where the market's at, it feels like we have, as I saw with the inflation, um, you know, things have started to level out. That's at least the feeling. Um, it feels like the right thing to do is to go out to bid. The benefit of that is it allows for a multi-year, A, you get potentially competition from another vendor or vendors, and you can have multi-year agreement, right? So like we, from our perspective, the, the, the interesting thing or the thing I would like about that is as we try to identify like, what are we doing or what is, how are we going to plan for this is it would give us some cost certainty and we know what it is for either a three or four or five year period, whatever we so choose um, as far as length. Um, that said, as I'm preparing those documents and getting ready to send that out to, to potential vendors, I feel like if we were going to do something different, more than a minor tweak than what we're doing now, I would, I feel like it would, the right thing to do would be to incorporate that into the bid documents. And so what I'm asking, I guess, is given what I've shared with the finances and some of the incremental adjustments, um, you know, we're, we're, we are certainly limited on the revenue side, but on the expenditure side, you could probably do things to get that percentage to be where I think most of us would like it to be. But when I look at the distance that our writers live, you would essentially be, to get it to be meaningful and to, you would have to eliminate um, service to to the younger kids. That's essentially where, so that's, so like when I think about, you know, steps that could be taken, that's really what I want to know from the board. Is that something that the board views as like on the table or do we not feel like we have reached that point yet or, or you know, reached that point? And if that's the case, then I can just proceed and draw up documents similar to what we have um, had in the past. Okay, so, so <laughs> there's so much there, Corey. So I, I think, um, so yeah, do you wanna say something, Carrie? I could rephrase the question. Yeah, <laughs> please. <Go ahead. laughs> so I think really what we're looking at is going out to bid and it, before doing that, um, we know that the board's goal is to reduce the subsidy that the board is paying for a user service. Yeah. We can continue to proceed as we've been doing um, incrementally, small incremental adjustments through con with the increase of costs, increasing fees, um, and in trying to offset a bit of that subsidy, the reality is we won't be able to get to reduce that subsidy significantly unless we change how we provide service. And so what Corey is asking is, do you, is it, is, it, is it the board's desire to really focus on reducing that subsidy? In which case we have to look at 
changes, more significant changes to how we provide service, meaning reducing those who are eligible to ride, period. Right. That's one option. The other option is just continue to just make small incremental changes toward reducing the subsidy, recognizing that really it, it's going to be small. There isn't much opportunity to adjust um, by just changing fees alone. Because you, you don't feel like you can change the fees because you'll lose all the riders. I mean, like pri there, price. Alone. Right. We could, we could increase the fees to just match exactly what the cost of service is. And we predict that that would reduce the number of people wanting to use the service. And in that interim, we'll end up not really reducing the subsidy, right? Because there'll be fewer riders to offset the cost. So we have to set the cost not knowing how many people will sign up for it. Okay. So, right. We could just simply say, this is what we estimate the cost to be. This is how many riders we estimate to, we will get. Here's the fee. And we think what will end up happening is we'll end up with about the same percentage of subsidy. Um, so so that's that's really... To really make a big dent in the subsidy that the board pays for this user service, we would have to change the way we provide service. And from our brainstorming and consultation with other districts and the bus company, the way to do that really would be to say, you're not allowed to ride the bus if you live closer than a mile or closer than a half a mile. We're just not making the service available to you. Many districts do that. That hasn't been our district stance in the past. and so. If it's the board's priority to reduce the subsidy, we would have to dramatically change how we provide service. Okay. Yeah. Uh, a mile, like you're saying it if you want to do it for a mile. I mean, that's the difference. Is there another change that you want to make it dramatic? That doesn't feel dramatic. It doesn't feel dramatic to you. It would feel dramatic to those who are accustomed to putting their child on a bus to school to get to school from their house that is three quarters of a mile away from school. In our community, they've relied on that bus service for a while. So it will feel like a significant change to those families who have relied on that service. In other communities, it might not feel so significant because they're maybe not getting bus service to start with. But here, we've, we've made bus service available to anyone who wants to sign up. Um, you know the percentage of families that are less than a mile that use the bus? I mean, are we talking five families or 20%? No, 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 no. So, no, 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 no. So when I've looked at, yeah, when I've looked at this, um, we'll, we'll just start with the lowest threshold because we were kicking around. Uh, let me find my... So for a half mile like that, like in some other districts, that was like something that Dr. Grimskley and I talked about because in some places, like they don't even offer, I think where, where I previously worked, didn't even offer. It was actually way less than I thought. So at a half mile or less, Harper and Highcrest had zero. Mackenzie Central and Junior High each had one and Ramona had five. So there's root. Say those numbers again, Corey. Yeah. Harper, Hi, Harper, Harper and Highcrest had zero. zero. Yep. Mackenzie Central, Junior High each had one. One person, one family, one, 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 one individual, one individual one who rides the bus for less than half a mile. Yep. Ramona. And Ramona had five. Um, so like that's there. But then when we start to talk about it in the context of routes, so really then the next um, thing is, you know, if you were to go between like a ha half mile and say a mile and a half, um, you really got to go to like move the needle where you're, you would eliminate routes. You have to like push it up over a mile. Like I think it's closer to a mile and a half. And what generally would happen is the lower, the lower, the elementary schools would not have service. And at the five, eight level, it would really be people who just live far East and far West. And um, which at the five eight level, that it that does make up a huge uh, portion of those riders, but um, that's roughly where it, where it works out. Because like you could go up to a mile, but then you would still probably have, you know, five or ten at an elementary building. Well, you still have the route. 
So you still have the cost. So it's a matter of running the route or not running the route in, at the elementary levels. Um, but how many families use the elementary bus total, including all the miles? Do you know that number? Um, Maybe the yes. Let me, let me just make sure I have the right thing. Here. In the meantime, I applaud your ability to convey the complexity of all this. <laughs> so hesitate to second guess any of it. Well, it that's exactly yeah. Four yeah. five, like, mm -hmm. which is why then it becomes that more dramatic change. It, it essentially means, do you want us to continue to run elementary bus routes right. and recognize that then the board is subsidizing a portion of that? Yeah. Or do you want us to look at saying kids can walk to school or get transportation from their family to school? We're not providing the routes anymore um, because anything in between doesn't really make a big enough difference for us to eliminate the routes. And the only way to save money is to eliminate a route. I have a related, sorry. Um, is there like a safety issue with, I mean, do we have a preference between kids riding the bus and not riding the bus? I'm just thinking in terms of what the principals can manage in the morning, that kind of thing. I think that um, buses bring about some benefits and some drawbacks. Oh, okay. I think if, if we didn't have buses, there would be much longer carpool lines. Yeah, right. Um, at arrival and dismissal and that can be a headache but managing bus service can be a headache as well um so you know i think there's probably yeah. benefits and drawbacks either way not a strong enough opinion i could certainly gather additional information but probably not a strong enough opinion to guide the board's um, decision making in this regard it, it um there's benefits and drawbacks busing can be quite a headache to manage right. at a building level right when do we have to make a decision? Well, so really the like the way I was looking at it is the first step is whether this is something that was even on the table because we would want to, you know, have it in the bid documents. If, if, if it were something we were even thinking about, we would, I would want to, I would feel like because like what, what I'm envisioning the process, like documents are going to go out. Typically there's a pre-bid meeting. People can come in, can provide some clarity. Um, you know, you know, I, I, like I would certainly feel obligated. Like I wouldn't want to put out a bid document and said, Hey, we have 12 and a half routes. That's the basis of this bid, which as you saw, I think is up around a million dollars. And then, a year or two in to a five-year deal, we're like, oh, just kidding. We're going to go down to five routes. Like that, that would be pretty tough pill to swallow, I think, for so someone why, that you're trying to be partners with. So that's why you need to know whether that, we want to stay the course and go in yeah. incrementally or make a yeah. major yeah. shift in the premise of how we're is, providing is the question Is the question, are we comfortable eliminating elementary school routes? <laughs> uh, are we thinking that we might is that a consideration on the table right that's really what it is is it are it is are we it really important to the board that they reduce that you reduce the subsidy that you would be willing to make a a dramatic change in how we provide service which and a dramatic change would be eliminating routes at the elementary level yeah yes okay if you're not willing to do that then that if, if you don't think you're willing to do that at this point, then Corey can proceed with building the bid documents in such a way as to estimate that we have 12 and a half routes now, and it's pretty likely we'll continue to have about that many. He doesn't have to give a qualifier of, well, maybe in three years we'll only have five routes. Um, again, anything can change, but we want to go out to bid in good faith. Um, and we also, it is helpful to have the board's kind of direction on where we're trying to move this fee. Um, what I'm, what I, I feel like I'm hearing, and tell me if I'm reading the room incorrectly, but um, is is the same direction Corey and I lead in, which lean in, which is 
let's continue to make incremental changes. We're not right now in a position or in a financial need to make a dramatic change to how we provide service. I agree with that. I feel like eliminating elementary routes is a pretty dramatic change for people in the community. I, I think that would be, a, yeah, a big deal. Okay. But can I just ask what the, sorry. Bonnie sorry. had a question. No, oh, please. please. No, yes. please. I just want to know how much money we're talking about. Well, the total cost of the contract is, is about $1 million. Okay. Well, routes for how many families does it? Which would, and it's like, it's, it's to do the math, right? You have to figure out how much you would save What's and then say, all right, well, 75% of that or whatever. Like, so the subsidy that the board pays or is estimated to pay is around $250,000, right? Um, for this upcoming year. How much would you reduce it? Well, you would reduce the costs of, of the busing by about half. And the other buses are pretty well full. Um, so you could you could reduce that pretty significantly, I think. You wouldn't reduce it all the way, but um, you would reduce that subsidy by, by at least by half, if not maybe even more, because really the the buses that go to the go to High Crest and the junior high are full. In a full bus, you can recoup the costs of running it. So we're talking one hundred and thirty thousand dollars. Maybe, yeah, potentially more. I mean, potentially more. I mean, yeah, you could, mm -hmm. you could, yeah, you could potentially get it if those. It could be two hundred and sixty thousand yeah. dollars. Yeah, you could. Yeah, to me, that's the question. Oh, Bonnie. Um, I have a couple questions. Um, so, first of all, when you um, say that there are like. 12 routes in the morning, would that, would it be safe to say that like four of those are for the elementary schools or, or how, how many routes go to the elementary schools? Uh, let's see here. Or is um, that, is that tough to say? Because no, no, no. I, I've got a sheet. Uh, Harper has one that's, that's been consistent. Um, Central has one, I believe. In the morning, Ramona has two, and Mackenzie looks like Mackenzie has one. Do so. you think that will change next year because of full day kindergarten, or 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 how will that affect? I um, I not not likely. The, I mean, the last few years that we've had the Keep Thirty Nine program, we've was it like ninety five percent or 90 or 95% of the students eligible or at that grade level have chosen to be in the program. Um, so if they're there full day and their, and their families needed the busing, I assume they've been signing up for it. So. Well, I mean, I was just wondering if the, if, if the because they're half day, that that would be, a, you know, would there be a reduction in that, that middle part? Where somebody would be taking the bus because they were leaving after the morning, or, or oh, no, oh, you, oh, that service is not currently available. Okay. Yeah, the last, I think at one time, but typically um, that would have been something. But So my my preliminary thoughts are that um, that first of all it would be a, a shame to um, eliminate the elementary bus program, um, but I also feel like um, trying to maintain like this you know or or as we were incrementally trying to um, lower our costs for these um, user based fees um, is that because of COVID and you know when you look at these numbers and like if you have a child who started taking the bus in first grade and by the time they're they're leaving um, Wilmette Junior High, the cost has gone up for busing like, you know, $400. I mean, it seems like pretty extraordinary. I mean, we understand why that happened. It's because of COVID and the unavailability of drivers and, and stuff. So uh, like is, I mean, I would love to see the bus program continue the way it is. And that maybe the priority of reducing that our costs, you know, um, in, in, in keeping in, in alignment with um, with our um, um, with our views on how to handle like user based fees um, that I would like to see 
you know, that, that I, I don't have that same concern of lowering that. I don't know how, all, how you all feel. So Bonnie, if I, I just wanna make sure I heard you correctly. You would like to see us continue with offering the services that we are mm -hmm. and simply to make the incremental changes in fees, but, but you're inclined toward um, continuing the service and, and not increasing fees dramatically to offset those costs. Not increasing the fees dramatically and maybe even, you know, like being okay with holding them. Yes. Okay. Like I'm not like that 77% going down to 74% or like, I don't really know where that number, you know, where the, the sweet spot is, but if we were going towards 80%, like just to hold back on that a little bit in the next couple of years. Thank you. Right. Uh, do you guys have your guidance that you think you, that you wanted? Uh, well, let me see if I can say what I think <laughs> the board is saying, and you all can <laughs> affirm that. Um, I think the board is saying right now, as Corey builds the bid documents for transportation services, the board is not anticipating making significant changes to the way in which we offer service. And right. in we, terms we of fees, yeah. we will continue to look at what those costs will be to the board and then in turn what the fees will be to our community as we get those costs back. So we'll go out to bid, we'll have estimates of what those costs will be, and then we'll have to come back to the board to talk about is 950 round trip fee the right fee? Or do we increase that by CPI, by the cost of the increasing contract, which here Corey has estimated to be, I think, four and a half percent, or some factor in there? Really, that just becomes a, a financial decision on behalf of the board that will impact um, how much families need to pay for the service. Okay, so we're, oh, sorry. So, Corey, are you intending to do a like a one year deal or are you trying to do a five year deal? Or you don't know? So, okay, so I'll give you a little bit of history. Um, prior to a, a school code change uh, a few years ago, um, when you went out to bid, it was three year contract in the code. And then after that, you could do a two year extension. And then after that, you could do um, one year extensions at mutual agreement forever, unless somebody, another vendor came to you and said, I'm mandating you bid. Well, then they changed it and said, because in some communities, maybe a, from a from a bus provider perspective, it wasn't, they weren't interested in like taking on that as a client or they didn't find it appealing. You would have had, you theoretically could have had somebody that did a bid in the nineties. And then if they keep having a good arrangement and people agree, they, it could have, you know, been 30 years or more. And so they, the limit now is you must bid every 10, but they loosened up the, they gave more flexibility in the period of time for the contract. So I think like you could bid for 10, but I'm thinking it from, if I was in North Shore shoes or a competitor, what would I be comfortable signing to? Which is why in prior years, I haven't necessarily recommended going out to bid because if I was in North Shore shoes, and inflation was really high and I didn't know what was going to happen with wages and other things that are really expensive for them. If I had to fill out a bid form, I would just be like, okay, 12%, 10%, you know, I'd be throwing a high number because I don't want to get caught. Um, so I'm thinking somewhere, what I intended the form to say is um, have options for three, four and five years. And then we just look at the numbers and say, what's most advantageous to us. Um, it gives us a little bit of certainty. We can, plan um but we're not like you know locked in for forever or anything yes <laughs> okay <laughs> i did can i add one thing because i had forgotten um on on the prior point of the five-year projection because i was making a point about state support and what bugs me about this projection which i'm sure is properly prepared um is is that it doesn't count the, the state's con contribution to the TRS retirement, which is massive and an enormous subsidy for our district of unbelievable proportion. And I think we reflect it in our financials, yes. but just not here. Yeah. So just 
want to make that point because I did forget. Thank you. That's all. Okay, I think we're ready to move on. Um, we're moving on to the strategy committee, Mrs. Schneider Fabes. Sure, thank you. Uh, so as the board is aware, um, we have been giving regular updates to the board on our progress related to our action steps. And this seemed um, here in December like a good opportunity just to celebrate the work of a, a team that came together um, to look at culture and climate uh, throughout our district as part of our strategic plan. So this really is just a, a quick update regarding our joint culture and climate leadership team. Um, Again, looking here at our strategic plan, this falls most significantly in goals two and three, but we know really it has an impact across each of our goals um, as we look at uh, the research that supports how people feel within our schools will affect how they learn, how they work, and, and how connected they feel um, to the work that we're doing. And so um, we partnered with the National School Climate Center last year um, for some professional development for our joint leadership team, as well as to help us launch a new survey around culture and climate. That survey um, took the place of five essentials, and we're hoping that it will continue to take the place of five essentials moving forward. We got some really good and useful information that I think our school teams, as well as our joint leadership team, um, used to inform some improvement efforts um, and I'm really proud of this work, largely because it has been kind of a grassroots effort. So we formed this joint leadership team. We made sure that we had representatives from across the district in all stakeholder groups. And then we kind of sat together and said, what do we want to do? What do we want to accomplish together? Um, and there's been some really uh, wonderful um, focused efforts as a result of that. So this is really just an an opportunity to celebrate that. We learned from the National School Climate Center about their stages of climate improvement process and really looking at the building and the district as well as our classrooms and community surrounding students as we evaluate action plan implement and then reevaluate. This is our uh, culture and climate joint leadership team. Again, this is our district team. You'll see as you look through here that we have representatives from our Wilmette Education Association, from our support staff union, from our administration, um, as well as um, myself helping to lead this group and, and Leo supporting as well. Um, our changes this year, we've added a few more people so that each school has at least two representatives on the team. Um, and again, these conversations at the district level have been supportive and organizational in nature, but really the real work is what's happening at the school level and our principals and our school level representatives have taken this work and folded it into their school-based um, improvement efforts. So um, this is really collaborative work at the joint leadership level. At the district level, we have set five meetings this year. We've held two of those. Those meetings have helped us to really focus on the work that um, we've chosen for this year, which is to collaborate and support the school goals and then to identify any um, supports that may need to be supplemented or um, sustained at the district level. And then we're also planning for the CSEI survey, which we anticipate will happen just before um, spring break. These are some of the celebrations that our school teams have identified um, at every school we've uh, conceived of or folded in this work into the structures that are already happening at our school. So um, there's school-based culture and climate work happening, looking really at the, the CSCI results. The CSCI is that um, climate survey that um, gives us some information about where we're succeeding, what our strengths are, and then what some opportunities might uh, be to continue to improve. Um, we're also celebrating across our district at each school the, the work of our foundations teams that are really focused on some of those areas that CSCI identified as um, areas for improvement. So really looking at what are the rules, the expectations, and the reinforcement of those expectations. How are we being proactive in supporting our students and our staff to understand and reinforce those? Um, we've celebrated the DEIB themes and the team that is supporting that work. We have a district team 
um, of representatives that helps to support that work in really focusing on supporting the, the connection and that sense of belonging for each and every individual in ways that are meaningful and relevant to the work um, that's happening in our schools. Um, one of the areas that was identified through our CSCI um, as an opportunity for improvement is looking at upstander behavior and how are we supporting that in each of our schools. And um, we've seen some improvements there in our school teams. Our representatives on the joint leadership team were really celebrating that there's been some lessons identified for that work. Um, there's some school-based um, activities and even speakers who are coming in to address our students and, and support this. Um, so again, really recognizing that um, we're trying to be proactive in teaching our students how to be upstanders, how to create a sense of belonging and connection within our schools and to support one another. And then the other thing that I wanted to mention that our school teams really celebrated is that um, through our CSCI, we learned that um, staff inclusion activities and celebrations was an important area for us to continue to expand. We've done a number of things over the last several years at the district level to try and support that. But now our schools are really taking that on and trying to build those connections for our staff in, in recognition of the importance there for culture and climate within our schools. So lots of celebrations. And again, I think the, the, the biggest thing I, I want to acknowledge and celebrate is these are efforts that are happening as part of the regular and ongoing work of our schools. It doesn't, I, I, I don't think, feel like an add on to the work that we're already doing, but this collaborative approach is allowing us to learn from one another and support each other's work. These are just some of the things that our school teams and representatives have celebrated in the work, um, really um, acknowledging that this work has been has allowed our schools to feel empowered to really work collaboratively and in aligned ways, and then to tailor the work to what the schools want to do. So when we first envisioned this joint leadership team, I think there were a few worries. I know for myself in particular, I was worried that this was going to be another district effort that was going to direct what was happening at the schools. And in turn, instead, it's really been schools being empowered to um, focus on the areas that they think are most important to them and to make um, make adjustments there. So, so a lot of celebrations here. Um, next step areas, these are some of the things that our school teams have identified. We need to continue to plan for CSCI administration and there's some key ways in which we want to look at that. We're still waiting for some information from the state in terms of, of timing. Um, we learned from last year's administration. We wanna make sure that we're supporting that administration and then clarifying some of the language of the survey so that students feel like they can adequately respond to that. Um, our, our school teams and our district leadership team identified that strengthening our school and district vision and voice um, through communication and cross-district collaboration um, are, are some areas that we can continue to, to strengthen and grow in. Um, we're doing a lot with SEL and our DEIB efforts, and we want to continue that. Um, our DEIB themes seem to have really taken hold within our schools, and so that has been an area of celebration, but we want to um, continue to build ways to partner with parents, to communicate with parents about the work that we're doing, and to really integrate that in authentic ways for our, our students and for our families. Um, our school teams identified that they would uh, love to continue to generate some additional ideas for authentic inclusion of our students with disabilities into activities and projects within our schools. And so our joint leadership team has generated some ideas in that regard. And then finally, I acknowledge that um, upstander behavior and, and some supports there, that's been an area of celebration. And yet we wanna continue to expand that as we move forward. Um, and we're eager for the CSCI results to help us to inform those next steps. So again, just kind of celebrating and, and wanting to acknowledge those team members who are giving of their time and their leadership for this effort. It really has been um, a, a focused effort collaborative and aligned throughout our district. We're um, finding that that stakeholder voice agency and leadership in the process and the decision-making makes it feel like it is owned by many and not just the work of a few. So we're really, um, again, proud of the work that has been accomplished. I want to thank those who are giving of their time after a long day to, to join our joint leadership team and, and share their stories and experiences and, and learn from one another. 
And then um, our CSCI survey, which is the new um, culture and climate survey that will be happening again this year. Um, as a reminder, we're waiting for some additional information from the state um, because this is an alternate survey to the five essentials. Um, but we do anticipate um, that we will be able to administer the survey again. These are the five areas that the survey focuses on and we get these results back by school and by district so that we can uh, guide our improvement efforts. As I mentioned, we expect we'll be able to administer the survey about three weeks leading up to spring break, um, but we're awaiting time from, um, from the state. And um, this is how our data gets used. Our joint leadership team and our building-based school teams will continue to work together to analyze those results and, and continue to, to build upon the improvements that we've already seen. That's it just kind of a, a quick update on that work that is happening within our schools. And again, appreciation for those team members who are leading not only at the district level, but more importantly at the school level. Thank you, Ms. Sure. Um, I, I thank you, Carrie. This is great. I love the team. I think that's, it's so well represented. Thank you. Um, so that's my comment. I have a question now, okay. which is, um, one of the things that's bothered me and about our strategic plan, and, um, and I'm sure this committee is thinking about it, but I just haven't seen it in writing, is um, socioeconomic concerns. You know, I see DEIB, and, and that probably the idea of socioeconomic issues kind of fits into that. Um, but I'm, I'm curious about conversations. Does that come up? because yeah, I think we have a relative, I mean, you know, it's maybe more diverse probably, but there is some significant diversity within our district on the socioeconomic level as far as, you know, resources that the parents have. Um, so the, the joint leadership team for culture and climate is really looking at the school culture and climate, um, not the DEIB efforts and themes specifically. Um, but so, so that's not this team, that would be the DEIB um, team that is planning out those monthly themes. So as we look at those monthly themes, um, those we have taken an approach of really recognizing and honoring each individual and what makes each of those individuals special. So um, we don't, um, so what we're focusing on, for example, in September, our names are important. In October, our identities are important. In November, our families are important. And each individual brings to the table whatever it is that represents them. Um, so it's a little bit of a different bend on DEIB than maybe what you're thinking of, which is thinking about the, the discrete demographic groups that, that comprise our district as a whole. Um, instead, we're really focusing on building those connections and that sense of belonging for all individuals, regardless of their race, color, creed, yeah. socioeconomic background, really recognizing that each individual um, is special and unique and has the opportunity to be celebrated. So this is just not the place for that, it sounds like. Um, I, I think what you're wanting to discuss is um, maybe differences Art. in how... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, it's it's hard to discuss, right? It's 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 economic resources of the kids' parents, yes. basically, you know, and the kid themselves. So that I think has a pretty profound effect. It does. It it certainly does. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I just I haven't seen it very much. I know I know we've talked about it every once in a while, but and and I'm sure it's you know, I'm sure we think about it all the time, right? It's just I I don't see it written down. So I think what you're asking is when we're looking at diversity and supporting um, a sense of connection and belonging for all students, you want us to also consider the diversity that is evident in socioeconomic status in addition to race and, and color and religion and the other language backgrounds, um, the other things that we think of maybe more traditionally in terms of diversity. Yeah. Okay. Okay, great. Kelly, thanks for jumping in. Sure, um, and, and that is something that we do talk about at the district um, DEIB committee um, level and I think at individual schools. One thing that I did wanna note was that um, as we um, 
as we think about the socioeconomic differences, we have looked at some of the structures that we have in place. So for example, the club system that we have put in place at um, High Crest and the junior high, we've brought many of those internally. So the instead of having parents and students pay fees for these clubs, we've made them accessible to everybody at the school. So we're looking at some of our internal structures to make them more accessible to kids, no matter their um, economic status, if you will. So that's one, one thing that we are considering kind of a different level than maybe lessons or um, a monthly theme, but trying to put some of those things in place. Thank you, John. And I think it's, it's valuable feedback for us to continue to think about as we gather input from our students and families about their sense of connection and belonging to also consider differences that might be evident as a result of their socioeconomic status. So um, thank you for for elevating that, yeah. I appreciate it. I would just say, you're talking about celebrating. I'm, I'm, and you talk about being proud, and I have that shared sense of pride and celebration. This is exciting, and I think the fact that you talked about it, you know, not being sort of like you know something coming from the top and directed. It's, in, it sounds integrated. If I'm understanding you correctly, it, it feels that way. And again, when we launched this team, we weren't quite sure what was going to come of it. We just thought we should we should have a focused effort on it. And so, I, yes, yeah. so very proud of what our teams are doing. Yes, thank you. Okay, all right, we're good. This would be the opportunity for the public to address the board, but seeing no public here, we will move on to old business which is elementary class size follow-up. I'm gonna turn this over to Dr. Kremis Coley. Thank you. Uh, the board will recall at the November Committee of the Whole, um, the board reviewed elementary class size and some additional information was compiled at that time. Um, and then the board asked for some, the board engaged in some discussion and asked for some additional follow-up information. That information has been provided and, um, and reviewed. And so at this point, um, I'm really just bringing this item back so that we can begin to plan for the upcoming school year. Um, my sense is that based on all of this review, the board seems comfortable proceeding with our current class size guidance. Um, isn't directing any immediate change to that. Um, and we are very grateful that uh, the board continues to allow for our careful consideration of those unique circumstances that uh, come up from year to year that may cause us to make adjustments to how we're planning for the year. Um, we'll continue to study the impact of future adjustments. Obviously enrollment has a huge impact on that, uh, but wanted to circle back and give the board the opportunity to either give us some additional feedback, direct us otherwise, or to simply affirm that um, you want to see us continue with the current guidelines. Board members, um, yeah, I guess, where are we at on that? Thank you for all that work. It was impressive. Uh, my recollection is the recommendation was to leave the guidance as it is, which, which I would I would be inclined to do so. Are there uh, other board members? Support that as well, okay. leaving the guidance as it is and grateful for all the work that's been done over the past month or so. And the data was interesting and learned a great deal for, from it and feel even more confident with the recommendation. So thank you. Okay. That's so what I'm hearing. I'm seeing nods. So we're staying the course. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, is there any new business? Okay, then I seek a motion to adjourn to executive session to discuss special education, individual student matters, specific personnel and collective negotiations. Move to adjourn to executive session to discuss special education, individual student matters, specific personnel and collective negotiations. May I have a second? Second. Motion having been made and seconded, will the clerk please call the roll? Allison Pavlis? Yes. Lisa Schneider Fabes. Yes. John Cesaretti. Yes. Ann Hart. Yes. Bonnie King. Yes. Aaron Stone. Yes. Motion carries. We are now adjourned to executive session, and the time is 10.02 a.m.